So this morning I asked on Instagram if anybody was interested in hearing about why I use a prong collar, and it seems like people do. Uh, but before I talk about the why, I wanna show you just a little bit of the how. Remy, I need your help, bro. Come on. Let's go. So I can remember the first time I ever even saw a prong collar in real life. Uh, and I remember saying to the guy who was teaching me at the time, I was like, dude, that looks like a medieval torture device. I can't imagine any reason why I would ever want to put that on my dog. Uh, and luckily for me, he was able to teach me the real way to use it. And it's evolved, you know, my use of it has evolved a lot over time. And in this video, we'll get to the how. And at the end, I'm gonna point you in the best direction of the how that I know is available. But right now, I'm more interested in the why. started raining right as I got here. Lucky I got one waterproof camera. <laughs> While I'm sitting up, I've got to show you my favorite dog who I bump into down here sometimes. Sit. So apologies for this mad continuity break um, and the echo in here, but truth is I actually filmed this video ages ago and uh, I know that statistically like 34% of you are about to stop watching. Uh, and at the end of this, I'm about to go home and I'm gonna tell you why I use a prong collar and then I'm gonna point you in the direction of the how. But I wanna tell you now where the how is in case you don't care about my why. So Jazz, has just finished filming like a whole series on how to implement the prong collar in exactly the way you just watch me use it. And she did it with the two shepherds that we're here training right now. So where can they find that? 
prime-canine.com in the, on the, in the online content section. You get all that? There's links in the description. All right, I'm gonna, in this video, look for somewhere to film in the rain, get angry about it, go home, and then tell you a bunch of stuff. Okay. Hi. <laughs> This rain's getting crazy. There's water dripping on my lens. I'm gonna have to do this at home. Oh, it got pretty rainy out there. I don't know if you guys could tell from that footage. Um, anyway, hey, we're back in the office and let's talk about why I use a prong collar. There's really probably two reasons why I use a prong collar. And the first is to provide my dog guidance into correct behaviors that will lead to positive reinforcement. So in that way, you know, the, the, the real term is negative reinforcement. It's guiding pressure that motivates my dog to find an alternative to what he's doing. And the moment he does find that alternative, that pressure stops. Now, is it heaps? Am I cranking on the dog? No, you see the way that I use it. That is not only, you know, not helpful, it's not the way that, uh, my want to communicate with my dog, if I'm honest. Uh, for my dog, that prong collar is something that he's been made sensitive to. And by that, I mean, it's not like it hurts him a lot. It's sensitive in that way. What it means is that he knows that it provides inputs that he should find the behavior that will turn off. And he's been taught that by just moving towards it and learning that he moves his body in that directional manner that the prong collar provides in order to turn off that pressure in order to earn positive reinforcement. So it's a highly motivated tool that I'm using. I'm not gonna hide from the word aversive because the truth is like negative reinforcement is that. It has to be at the minimum annoying to the dog to motivate the dog to wanna to turn it off in order for it to be negative reinforcement. So you see, like the argument often will come then, like why don't you use a slip lead? Why don't you use a flat collar if it's not like you're hurting the dog in some big manner, you could use one of those tools. And the truth is for some dogs you can, for a lot of dogs you can, uh, but for my dog and a lot of the dogs that I train, they have, those other tools have different meanings and in different contexts make the dog perform different behaviors. So for example, the slip lead to my dog has a specific function in the bite work, as well as the flat collar is actually the same. The flat collar to my dog is he has been desensitized to, so that when that's on, he knows he can pull into that. In fact, that he should pull into that because that's what's been taught to him in the bite work. So if I were to try and use the flat collar in the way that you just saw me use the prong collar, it would have the actual opposite effect because my dog doesn't try to turn off the pressure of the flat collar by relieving that pressure. He tries to turn off the pressure of the flat collar by driving into that pressure. So people who try and do those two things with the same tool often cause quite a lot of conflict in their dog in doing that. The other you know, reason why I would use the prong collar to help guide my dog into specific behaviors over a lure is that often I do use the lure, but in some behaviors you can't. So if the behavior that you're trying to help motivate the dog into is affected by the conflict of the presence of a reinforcer that you don't necessarily control the location of. So you know, take forging in the healing as an example. Everybody knows that probably the best way to stop that from happening and fix it when it does happening is via reward delivery and placement. And if you're in a game or you're training your dog where you're 100% in control of the placement of all the reinforcers, then you can and probably should do that. But I have to prepare my dog for things that he will want that I'm going to train him to think could be his reinforcer, his reward, that will be in the environment. Now, that might include things that are scattered on the field, that might include the decoy, or that might include like a bird flying past that I need my dog to think I will allow him to chase and therefore will perform exactly what I ask of him, which would be not chasing those birds in order to earn chasing those birds. So the conflict of the present of that type of reinforcer means that the best way for me to help my dog into the right position to earn the positive reinforcement is via negative reinforcement. So that's a lot on guiding pressure, but that's how I use it with the prong mostly. The other way is, you know, first we should talk about 
all serious dog trainers, uh, no matter what tools they use, no matter how they train dogs in the specifics, in the details, they all would agree that dog training is all about consequences. There has to be consequences for action, both positive and negative, and there has to be consequences for inaction, both positive and negative. Where we would, some of us would, you know, diverge is on what those consequences are and how they look like. For me, I don't limit myself and giving a timeout or a non-reinforcing marker as a consequence for an action that is correct is in some instances, in my opinion, more stressful on my dog and more damaging to the scenario and even potentially our relationship than I want to cause in that moment. So I'll do it sometimes if that's what is called for and if I think that that is going to you know, lead to the best learning outcome for the dog. But with some dogs and in some behaviors, if they get it wrong, the very best thing you can do for them is help them to get it right via pressure, a consequence of a, of, of a wrong action, help them into the correct position, show them reinforcement by the turning off of that pressure in that correct position, and then give them the opportunity to do it again in order to earn positive reinforcement. Or in some instances, we even let them have the positive reinforcement immediately post the pressure that pulled them into that behavior. So it gets kind of technical, right? But the truth is there's a lot of scientific evidence to back that up, that in high drive dogs, they want to just be shown what is right rather than have to figure that out for themselves. And a non-reinforcing marker and a timeout means the dog is left to wonder and he has to try something new the next time, which could potentially lead to the, the same problem or a new problem. Whereas guiding the dog via a tool like the prong collar into that position helps him understand that that position is correct and get, get it right the next time in order to earn the positive reinforcement. There's a lot to take in on that. I think one of the main things that people have to remember when you use the prong is that it can be extremely contextual and for the most part, dogs understand tools of pressure like that to be tools of negative reinforcement, i.e. when that pressure turns off, the dog's probably doing something and that is what he will try and do to turn off that pressure in the future. So sometimes we hear that prongs can make dogs aggressive and of course they can. They can make a dog anything. That's how reinforcement works. So if you want to use negative reinforcement, you can make a dog aggressive. You can make a dog not aggressive. You can make a dog sit. You can make a dog heal beautifully. You can make a dog not chase the ball when you've asked him not to. You can make anything happen via reinforcement and using the prong as negative reinforcement is one way to train those things. The big thing that's really super important about the prong is that you cannot give a correction with a prong collar. And by a correction, I mean you cannot give pressure to the dog for not performing a behavior and have the dog perform that behavior. You cannot do that with a prong collar if your learning phase has not included the prong collar. What do I mean by that? If your dog's in a sit, and you tell him to stand and he knows those things and he doesn't do it and you go and give him a pop with the prong, that is unlikely to make him stand because he doesn't know that that pressure can be turned off via that behavior. If you want to give a correction that makes the behavior you asked for happen that didn't happen, in this case our stand from the sit, if you want to give a correction with a prong collar doing that, there has to have been a learning phase with the prong collar of the stand from the sit. So that when the dog doesn't do it, that pop with the prong will be familiar to the dog and he'll understand, yep, I know what to do with that. That activates me to the stand. <sighs> There's a lot to it. It's a great tool, just kind of misunderstood and sometimes misused. And telling people that they shouldn't use it or, you know, or to stay away from it, uh, prevents them from getting that correct knowledge on how to use it properly. Speaking of getting the correct knowledge on how to use it properly, like I said, this video is a why, not a how. If you want to learn how, I'm going to put a link uh, in the description below to a friend of mine, Jazz's video on how to implement all that, how to teach behaviors with the prong, how to activate behaviors with the prong collar, and then how to use that prong collar to give a correction if needed. Anyway, that's it. Hope you enjoy this stuff. I like making it. It's good fun. 
Um, I want to give a huge thank you to the Patreon support supporters, the Patreon supporters of my podcast called The Canine Paradigm. I do that with my good friend, Glenn Cook. And you guys have paid for all of the equipment that I use to make this stuff. And I, uh, I honestly can't thank you guys enough. It means a, a great deal to me um, that we get that support. If you want to see more videos like this, drop a comment. Let me know what other things you want me to cover. Hit that like button if you're keen and maybe subscribe if you want to see more of it. I think that's it. There's people over here staring at me like I'm crazy talking to myself. They're right on both counts. Remy. <laughs>